All right. You ready ready for my question? Yeah. Why is it they say that um, humans, they don't uh, use all of their mind. They just use something like three or five percent of their mind. You got some genius. They use a good bit of their mind, but they're still not using all of their mind. What would happen if you if you build it? Uh, catch the con. Tell us. Tell us. Let me straighten you out. All right. The smartest person to ever live used probably only 10% of their mind. Now go ahead. Great. Charles. Oh. Bush I'm Bush sorry. Bush 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 if you Bush. ever, if you can ever use the whole 100% of your mind, what will happen? Okay. You'll be smart. No. Uh, <laughs> actually, if um, to, to say that you're using 100% of your ability to think, to process, means that you're using 100% of the essence of who you were created to be, and that is Elohim. So... That that ten percent, let's just use that number ten percent. That ten percent is bound not by spiritual, by the spiritual walls, um, because spiritual walls don't exist. That ten percent is bound by our earthly uh, environment, because we spend more of our time engaged with those things that we see with our eyes. And that is one of the reasons the world over, when people get ready to meditate, pray, or to um, uh, to um, connect with or to be one with a deity, they close their eyes. Why is that such an innate thing? Because we all know that everything that we see with our eyes are simply distractions. Just because we have an inner knowing of that, it does not mean that we are aware of it. And when we do become aware of it, it does not necessarily mean that we believe it. What So, so um, the whole idea of traveling the journey uh, the eternal journey of the spirit is a journey that is traveled with your eyes closed, but with your eye definitely opened. And as earlier, when the question was raised about the, the uh, fog in this that, that appears, um, it is an interlude with a spiritual um, with the spiritual world. It is. Um, an opportunity to go further. And I'll give you an example of what I'm saying. There was a photograph taken of, of a man and uh, who was standing in the pulpit, shrouded in light that you could not see with um, your eyes, but you could see with your eye, and it appeared. Um, and there were no lights behind, above, around him at all. And, and immediately that person took this very seriously and began to seek to understand it until religion robbed him of it. Uh, by, by getting so caught up into being a quote-unquote preacher-type person, they lost sight of it, and it became to no, it, no avail. Nothing came out of it when there was an opportunity uh, to expand the understanding of the spiritual so we have those periods when we um, when we can see further than the eyes can ever see, and seeing further has nothing to do with distance as much as it has to do with proximity. The thing that's the farthest away from us is the thing that is the closest to us, and that is the realm of the spirit that we very, very rarely venture into understanding. 
Okay, any other questions about that or anything else? Okay, that was the question sent. And um, that question uh, was about angels. And the question was, what happens to our personal angels of goodness and mercy at death? Do they return to God and stay with us till the resurrection? Uh, this is a, a very uh, religious question, and I don't say that negatively at all because all of us at some point or another um, have believed this or have been taught this in one form or another. We all um, have come to the same or brought to the same conclusions about it even though their approaches and teachings it may have been different. In order for us to uh, look at this, one of the things I think it, it would bear us, um, would do us well, rather, uh, to make an effort to understand, and that is what are we talking about when we are talking about death? When we, when we talk about death, um, we are are generally speaking about uh, leaving this body. Um, and at the same time, we talk about the demise of someone. Your mother is gone. She won't be back. Your friend was killed in a car accident. That's it. You won't see them again until you get to heaven, stuff like that. And sometimes they leave the heaven part off of it. Well, I attended a funeral, and in doing the attendance of that funeral, I, I heard this, and I've heard it a thousand times. Um, that's, your sister's dead, okay, let's say that. Um, you're told that your sister is dead, and then during the course of the funeral, the one who is speaking are the those who are designated to speak. Talk about that person being in heaven with Jesus and with their grandparents, etc. And then before the uh, end of that memorial service, someone would inadvertently say, well, well not inadvertently because they mean it, would say something like, um, Either today we leave uh, you with our condolences for the one who are, has died in your family, or we're sorry about the death of your sister. Now you can't have it both ways. If you believe that the death that death is the end of life, then how can you possibly believe that they are not that they are alive in some other place? The religion and death, religion and life, religion, spirituality, are full of diametrics. Um, they are confusing because we are constantly given um, messages, mixed messages about what we are to believe as well as how we are to live. We are told that we have to believe everything in the scriptures. And then we are told that we can't be like Jesus, even though Jesus said we could. We are told that uh, there is life after death. And then if there is life after death, then the question becomes, what is death? If we are living now, and we leave these body and we are living, then what is death? What's between my living now and my living outside of this body? What is death? Death has very little to do with, if anything, frankly, to do with the cessation of bio life. And the reason I say that is this. When the scripture said that if you eat from this tree, you will surely die, the 
thing that happened is the spirit was placed in flesh. So the end result of partaking of the tree of good and evil, and I don't want to get into it, to get into the reason on that right now, but the partaking of that resulted in death. And if it was bio death, no one would be alive. So that concept of death meant that you would be placed in this grave you call a body. So our concept of death is misappropriated. The reality of death is the spirit living in a confined space, a space with boundaries. And that space with boundaries, that confined space, is this body. So there is no such thing as the end of life. And death is, is not the end of bio life. Death is the beginning of bio life because you don't enter this body until you inhale the breath after exiting the womb. Does that make sense to you? Or are there any questions? Hey, Rip. Yes. What happened to you when when you is dying and you grasp for that last push of breath Where, and that's okay. it? I'll get to that in a minute, Charles, okay? Okay. Okay. So are there any comments about this first? Okay. When you say gasping for that last breath, the um, what, what's happening is we are more attached to this material world than we are to the spiritual world. And I say we, I'm talking about the overwhelming majority of us. And the last gasp is an effort to remain in this, in this material world. And when that does not happen, that, that's that last gasp of, that you're talking about. And then the, um, the, the spirit completely departs from the body. We call it the breath left the body, but it's the same thing. There is no difference between your breath and your spirit, the air around you, the wind that blows. All of those are the same thing. And it is very important to note that whether you embrace it or believe it or not, you are a giver, a creator of life. You're, you are spirit. And without you, there could be no vegetation on the earth. When you inhale, that is keeping your body alive. When you exhale, that is you giving life to the vegetation in the earth. The carbon dioxide that you exhale is responsible for keeping vegetation alive. So that, regardless of whether we accept it or not, we are indeed life givers, life sustainers, because we are life itself. And if we are life itself, then it is not virtually, it is totally impossible for any type of cessation of life to occur. Any questions about that? Yes, Reverend, when you when you say that we are so attached to this world, uh, it, it just came to my mind that when Jesus was here on earth, did he get attached? I mean, from the reading, from my reading, uh, I felt like he was attached, but he knew he had to go. He was attached. If he had not been, then he would not have said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will. Mm -hmm. So, yes, he, he was. See, this is the thing that that people overlook on purpose. Mm -hmm. There is no way that you can read that and not understand that Jesus did not want to die. Right. There's no way you can read that and not understand that, which means that Jesus was 
and is no different than any of us. The, the difference uh, in terms of humanity, the difference between him and us is that he had an understanding, acceptance of who he is, and that is the essence of Elohim. He had no problem with that, yet he was still a man. Any questions about that? Does that help you, Shirley? That helped me, yes. I, it just comes to my mind whenever you talk about that, yes. And, and also keep in mind that when he was on the cross, he did not exit the body until he chose to. Into thine hand I commend my spirit. It is under your authority that I release the spirit from this body. That's all he was saying. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so, uh, this whole um, idea of, of, of death, first of all, your body, your body has no life of its own, none whatsoever. If it were not for spirit, your body could not live. When a baby exits the womb, if that baby does not breathe, that baby doesn't live. If the spirit does not enter that body, that body cannot live. So the body itself is not life. It is life that keeps the body viable and gives it mobility. Do you understand what I am saying? Okay. Keep, talk, keep talking, Ray. Um. Like when you, it be, it's simple. When a woman has a baby, if that baby don't bleed, that baby don't don't breathe, that baby don't live, right? Right. 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 So that means the body is not alive until the breath enters. It. It's just a, it's just a ball of flesh until it inhales. That's when it becomes alive. Disconnect it from that, from that um, umbilical cord and see what happens. Because the life that, ba- that that baby uses to live prior to is the life of the, uh, of the parent, of the mother. That's what the life is. It's living from that life. And we say it all the time. She gave life to that child. She gave birth to that child. Do we not? So, yes. the body itself is not viable at all if it does not have spirit, if it does not have breath in it. It's just that simple. And it is so funny with the body because the smallest portion of what we breathe and what we inhale is the very thing that keeps the body alive. The smallest one of the, not the smallest, I'm sorry. Um, a portion of what we inhale, I should say, 27% of what we inhale is all it takes to keep the body alive. If you stop breathing, they do not give you everything that you inhale when you breathe. The only portion of what they give you is oxygen, and that's only 27% of what you breathe inhale. So... So what I am saying is this, that oxygen that you inhale is, 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 um, is, oxygen is a gas. Oxygen in itself is spiritual. You inhale aluminum, hydrogen, there are a number of elements that we inhale when we breathe. But oxygen is the only the only part of that that we are given when we stop breathing. I don't fully understand it, but I do know that there's something to that. So this whole idea of death is totally different than anything we have ever been taught about it. And when we exit the body, regardless of what we have been told, 
there there is no Jesus standing there to shake all of our hands. There have been billions of people to die. And with every one of those deaths, how long would the line be for those who want to shake Jesus' hand? This return into the uh, one from whom we came is becoming a part of the ocean again. It's becoming a part of the realm of the spirit all over again. It's like pouring a glass of water back into the ocean. You cannot tell which portion of that ocean came from that glass, from the portions that were already there. Even though while it was in that glass, there were distinctive differences in it. As far as the angelic port, well, before I go to that, are there any questions about this death? Okay. In order for us to understand the the, uh, concept of angels, uh, we have to look at the way the word is used in Scripture. The, The Scriptures are written as an allegory. They are written in the form of stories that tells us a spiritual truth. And the idioms of that time are incorporated in the allegory. And these idioms, an idiom is a form of speech that is pertinent to a group of people. Example, you worry me to death. If someone from another culture heard us say, you worry me to death, they would think, worry, you are killing me by worrying me, literally. That, that's, that's an idiom. So the idioms that are incorporated in the allegories and the scriptures are there for two, well, well, two reasons that I know, probably I know it more. One is... To, to, to remember what is written because it's in story form. Two is to hide the mystery of the truth. The mystery of the scriptures are hidden in plain sight in allegories and idioms. When it talks about the appearance of an angel, each time, whether it was uh, Jacob, Abraham, or Moses, or whomever, the appearance of an angel speaks to a vision or a dream that is being experienced at that moment. And the the, um, experience is written about or spoken of after the vision has ended. And, and, and if we understand or seek to understand the idiomatic um, aspects of the allegory, then we can understand what is meant there. So whether it is Hebrew, Arabic, or, uh, or uh, Aramaic, the word angel speaks to a message. And... We are talking about angels in the form of humans. That did not come into our belief system until the Catholic Church, through Michelangelo, painted a little chubby white dude flying around with the wings in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The understanding of angels in the original languages are simply messages that were sent to humanity or given to men from our Creator. And those messages came during periods of visions. If a message comes verbally, 
it is more difficult to remember than it is if it comes in the form of a story or something that's happening with something that you are familiar with. If I am familiar with a Chinese funeral, then if the message comes to me in the form of a funeral for Native Americans, then I'm confused as to what it means. But if it comes to me in the form of the Chinese funeral, and I'm familiar with the Chinese funeral, I'm more apt to remember it than I am if it's something foreign to me. It minimizes the confusion. So this whole idea about having guardian angels, especially when we talk about um, mercy and, um, uh, uh, um, and protection from these guardian angels, we are simply uh, talking about um, the, the, um, the presence or the presentation of a message during the course of our sleep or awakened hours when uh, we are open to receiving from our Creator or from the other realm or from the universe, however you want to term it. This idea of a physical being being an angel is a created thing in our minds because of how we have been taught. There, all of the message or messengers are actually spiritual. Let me give you an example. If you read the story of Abraham when the angels were in, in route to Lot, you will find that there were three. And each one of them had a message. And when the message was delivered, the angel no longer was present. So the message and the messenger are the same. So when, when, we, when we look at that, what we find is that Abraham was engaged in a vision while he sat in front of his tent. And his vision was about the circumstances that Lot was dealing with and living under. And Lot sitting at the gate at Sodom and Gomorrah was also having a vision, receiving a vision. And in doing so, both of those visions were, were the same but yet different in, in, in aspects of it. And after the performance, uh, after the, the deliverance of the message, the angels were gone, or the apparition that was in, in that vision were gone. No different than when someone in your dreams or visions at night when you're asleep are talking to you, you, you receive it, you hear it, you experience it, but when you wake up, they are no longer there because the message has been delivered. Any questions about that thus far or comments for that matter? Am I speaking with clarity? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the, the biggest thing about this physical manifestation of angels came through charismatic ministry. When people like Kenneth Hagin talked about 10 foot angels and people like um, what, whatever the name is, talked about angels that stand over in his corner looking at him at night. Um, these things were, these seeds were, were, were instilled in us and we began to bring them into fruition in our minds, and they are not in any way whatsoever scripturally based. So what I'm saying to each one of you is angels are messages slash messengers. 
when when in Revelation it talks about the angels of the church, we have heard and have said that the pastor is the angel of that church. No, he's not. If he's not bringing a message from God, he is not a, a, an angel. The message that comes to you comes through the messenger that the Creator has placed before you. Getting up early Sunday morning is not a message from the Creator. Ain't he all right is not a message from the Creator. God intended for, God said you're going to hell if you have an abortion is not a message from the Creator. All of these things are Caucasian, African messages that come from a book and come from the mind of a man and not the heart of the Creator. Why is it that if you can go to hell if you do not have a baby, but you don't go to hell if you kill the baby after it was born? How is it that I'm going to force you to do something that you don't want to do, and I'm not going to help you feed the child when it's born? The decision is yours, not mine, not the pastor's. The decision is yours. You make that choice. The reason that there are, have been a big push when it comes to abortion is because of the fear of the browning of America. All of it is politics. I know you ain't asked me about that, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So this whole idea about being the angel of a church has everything to do with whether or not you are a genuine conduit through which a message is being sent for the benefit, the uplifting, the encouragement of humanity. If you are not a source of encouragement, you are not a preacher sent by God, a teacher sent by God, a messenger sent by God. You are nothing but a problem. Every message warns you, encourages you, strengthens you. Messages from our Creator are geared toward giving us insight as to who we are. Even the trials that we go through do not come from this non-existent thing called the devil. The trials that we face are opportunities for strength. They are a message telling us about something that we need to work on or an area in our lives that needs strengthening. Not simply for us to be strong, but for us to be able to also strengthen someone else who's going through the same thing or something else. Being able to say, I have traveled that journey before, and I think as Barbara said, or Saturday or Sunday, whatever day it was, that it is not going through something. being strengthened by it, is growing through it, is growing in strength, is growing in identity. So when we talk about the, the angels, we're talking about messages. Are there any questions? Are there any comments? All right, now, when it comes to mercy and goodness, love and kindness, these are not angelic messages. These are the substances which, which, which we are made, we are created with the spiritual substances of mercy, love and kindness, forgiveness, um, etc. This, this is our makeup. This is our DNA. This is our spiritual essence. This is who we are. 
you 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 don't give love. You are love. So what happens is when you if you say you're giving love, you're giving yourself. You can't separate yourself from who you are. So so regardless of whether or not you're conscious of it, love should be oozing from you all the time. That should be a presence, a sense of love, even when you are chastising or correcting someone. That should never be an air of hatred anywhere about you, regardless of what's going on around you. You are the catalyst that can alter the, the, the energy, the emotions of any environment. And when you step into that environment, everyone and everything in your presence should know it. Know it not because of anger or fear, but know it because they, they sense something different about you. And, and, and nine times out of ten, the thing that they are sensing about you that they cannot put their fingers on is love. Because most of us do not know what it feels like to experience love. We know what it feels like to experience lust. And I don't mean lust in the way that we defined it. I'm talking about the type of lust that tells us that that we are attached to someone until they make us angry. Then all of a sudden, we tell, well, I, I just fell in love with you. No, you just stop the lust. There are different forms of lust. Desiring something for your benefit, lusting after something for your benefit. If you're in a relationship for your benefit, then you're in a relationship with yourself and no one else. So these, so, so we, this idea of experiencing love is foreign to a lot of people because when we experience it, it's, we don't know, we can identify it. Because no one has ever given us the opportunity to learn how to experience this or to know what that experience is other than the type of love that has strings attached to it, which is not love at all. Again, it is a form of lust. Any questions about that or comments? If there are no questions or no comments, this is probably going to be the shortest class ever. Because, honestly, that's all I have for you tonight or this evening. You had talked about about that same thing in class before about the angels and and not really knowing what love was because we it's love and not love and and a lot of people you see it a lot now they say they love you to your face but really it's sometimes it's, you see them it's only for what they can get out of you okay and you're right and that that's what I'm talking about that's exactly what I'm talking about So, anyway, I hope um, I answered the question that was um, said. And if there are questions, please keep in mind that all you have to do is text it, call, uh, call someone, and we'll do our best uh, to uh, answer the questions for you. In addition to relaying to you what the Creator has shown us that all of us are in need of, Understanding. Hey, Rep. Yes, sir. What happened to love when someone does things or done something wrong and then they thought I love of you because of the wrong things you've done? Okay, let me deal with that a minute, y'all. 
They can love you, but they don't have to put up with you. Just because I love you doesn't mean I'm going to let you do anything you want to do to me. Because if you love me, you wouldn't do it. These people who tell you, especially happening to females, you just need to pray about it and stick it out because it is a sin for you to divorce, and if you end up with somebody else, you're going to hell. The, the person that you are living with has already got you in hell. So ain't nowhere for you to go. You're already in hell. So what I'm saying in essence is this. I will be the first to tell you that you are not supposed to put up with any type of abuse at all. And if you are being abused, you need to separate yourself from that relationship because that is the wrong energy for you to be connected to. It doesn't matter whether it's verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. You need to separate from it. Emotional and physical and the verbal abuse are far more damaging than physical abuse is. Because emotional and, and verbal abuse are harder to detect to detect and are not and the wounds and scars from it are not visible to the eyes. Under no circumstances should you submit yourself to that. And anyone who tells you that God intends for you to stay in that type of a relationship do not have your best interests at heart, and they know absolutely nothing about the one who created you or them. And now, having said that, you don't ever stop loving anybody. All love is the same. The expressions of the love is different. If your expression of your love to your child is beating your child, that's abuse. If your expression of your love is beating the person that you're in a relationship with and loving your kid, then you are not being expressive of love to the one uh, who who you're with your, in your relationship. Love is the same. There are simply different expressions of it. And the expressions of love are based upon energy. And if your energy get confused or your mind confuses you, not your energy because it's never confused, but your mind confuses you, then you can direct the wrong energy in the wrong direction, and now you got a problem. I wanted to. Uh... No relationship. Oh, go ahead. Is worse abuse. No, re- no relationship. And you've heard people say, "Misery loves company." If you're being abused, whoever is abusing you is miserable with themselves, and they certainly don't love you. Are you with me? Any questions about that? Any comments about that? Yeah, I wanted to uh, comment further on the uh, uh, abuse thing. Uh, By no means uh, separating uh, oneself from an abusive relationship or separating oneself from uh, any situation mean that uh, they do not have love or love uh, is absence. Um, When we talk about love, we talk about whether or not there is uh, compassion towards or for uh, another. Uh, That's what the love is internally. So it is to not have your heart hardened or closed, so to speak. So, for example, uh, when Pastor Richard uh, uh, mentioned uh, the part about the person who was being abused definitely getting themselves out of that situation and separating themselves from that situation, they still can love that person from apart. That doesn't mean they have to talk to them. 
interact with them or anything like that. It just simply means that they still hold that person in a place in their heart where they want that person uh, to grow, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, they're not to the point where they completely uh, hate that person or want the destruction of that person, um, uh, et, et cetera. But uh, as he said, absolutely, uh, in, in no situation, does it mean when you separate yourself that you do not uh, uh, love some way? You can, and if, even if it's safe, you can even tell uh, that person, if it's uh, safe and appropriate, uh, you know, I love you. This is what uh, your behavior is doing to me or whatever. I cannot um, do this anymore and I need to, uh, you know, separate myself. Um, whenever you ready to change um, or change, I will always be there for you. I say in certain situations, there are other situations where it's best you just, um, you, you just leave. But the, the most important part we're talking about is we're talking about the matters of the heart, the matters of that continue uh, compassion and wanting well-being and growth of the individual, uh, seeing them in the light that we see ourselves, seeing them in the light that uh, we've been, that we talk about basically every week. Any questions about what Sheldon just said? Uh, Pastor Rich, I don't have a question, but I know uh, there's scriptures that I was always shared in the church in terms of 1 Corinthians 13. And, you know, I think in our, you know, um, study tonight and just uh, listening in the spirit, you know, where it talks about love bears all things, you know, I think that that's something that I just wanted to just mention, you know, in the macro, because I think people, how do they interpret that question is sometimes can cause um, pain if it's not totally understood, you know, in the right context. I just wanted to share that thought. What's your thoughts about that? Um, when you talked about bearing, it's not talking about bearing abuse, or being abused, rather. It's talking about it does not, it does not recoil uh, from from it from doing what it's supposed to do when it is confronted with adverse circumstances or when it's confronted by something uh, that um, seeks uh, to to uh, be destructive. It has nothing to do with someone being in a relationship and and someone telling them that if you love him, you will you will tolerate this because love bears all things. Um, I have I have been in counsel with someone who was in a mega church. And and the ones in that mega church told this person that in spite of the physical abuse that they were uh, enduring, that they needed to uh, stay with that person and pray their way through it. And my response to that was, so you are supposed to be on your knees, praying your way through it while he beat the hell out of you. That's what you need to ask the person who's doing your counseling. These are masculine uh, principles that seeks to um, free men of the response, any responsibility of being abusive. And I know there are some women who are abusive. Yes, I'm not that stupid not to know that. I know that. However, there is a saying, if you want to kill your wife, bring her to South Carolina. South Carolina is the most lenient state when it comes to the murder or abuse of a woman. So what I'm saying to you is that the overwhelming majority of the people who are abused are females by men, and we live in a male-dominated society. The scriptures were, were translated, interpreted for the benefit of males to free them from any responsibilities for their shortcomings, their evilness, their brutality, whatever. And there are no justifications for any type of abuse based on love. I, I, I love you, that's why I hit you, is foolish. Anyone who tells you, I hit you because you made me hit you, you should ask yourself, did you walk up to them, take their hand, and hit you? No. 
we are discussing this because somebody on this line is living in an abusive uh, situation because I don't believe we could bring up anything that does not pertain to someone who's listening. If you're not on this line, you know somebody who is. The elements of abuse in a relationship usually begin with a man yelling in your face and then telling you he's sorry and embracing you. And then it escalates to the point where he bumps you. And if you don't stop him there, it escalates until he pushes you. And when he pushes you and you cry, he embraces you and tells you it'll never happen again, takes you out to dinner, does all these crazy things for you, and the next time he hits you and tells you it's your fault. And if you buy into that, then it's on. So now, every time he gets frustrated about anything, he's going to put his hands on you. Under no circumstances should you tolerate that. So I'm saying this to you. The first time that he yells in your face, you need to put a stop to it or pack your clothes and leave because it's going to escalate. It's going to escalate. And I need to say this. A man who put his hands on a woman or any relationship, if a man beats his woman, whatever she does to him, he deserves it. I don't bite my tongue with that because I do not believe that there is any reason whatsoever that, that, that in a relationship there should be violence, be it me, a woman be no man or a man be no woman. I do not believe there should be violence. And there is nothing in, this, in any relationship, be it man or man, woman or woman, I don't care how it is. If it's abuse, our creator did not intend for it to be that way. As a matter of truth, you don't have a relationship. You have someone who you have enslaved to you, and you abuse them at will no differently than the slave master abused slaves at their will. Any questions about about that? I was about to say in that that situation, there is no um, uh, love that clearly is the driving force behind that as well, because the reason why someone... um, starts to uh, uh, yell um, very aggressively um, and then to move on to the physical uh, violence is because that person feels like they have lost control and want to control the situation and want to control uh, the other person. And that in itself is uh, is not love. Uh, As you said, that's more so of a situation between someone who's in a slave and, and a master. Uh, a relationship is uh, something that is both uh, individuals or all parties involved um, holding up uh, one another, uh, so to speak, and being there, or as we talked about earlier this week, in some sense, um, a sense of uh, a servitude or a, a elevating of the other. Um, that what you just described with the power and controlling and only wanting uh, one individual to do exactly what uh, it is that you want them to do is to have that person there to serve you. Right. Any questions about that? I'll comment. Pastor. I have a, another comment, um, and and, I, and I'm just being able to call in, so I, I probably missed the majority. You may have discussed this already, but as we're talking about love, and we know the scripture talks about love, loving thy neighbor as you love yourself, can we look at what it means to love yourself? And I think the premise of everything that we're talking about, about being in an abusive situation, takes us away from understanding loving yourself. Could you speak to that? First of all, if you are abusive to someone, it's because you don't love yourself. Uh, When when the scripture talks about about, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, um, first of all, you have to ask yourself if you love yourself. Now, if 
you if it says that, then there is a transverse of that. If you are abusive to your neighbor, it's because you are abusive to yourself. In other words, if you if you don't love your neighbor as you love yourself, then you hate your neighbor as you hate yourself. Does that make sense? It does. And, Just to, and, to, and go ahead. I was saying only to give one quick example before you go further that might be a little bit more understandable uh, uh, for, for people. I always think about it in terms of everyone knows this person, a person that always tells uh, lies, just habitual lies, it's lies, lies, lies. But also that person is always in denial about things to themselves. And so I can't actually expect that person to tell me the truth if they are not even being honest with themselves and they refuse to tell themselves the truth or at least see the truth. They only can uh, extend to me what it is or uh, up until their own personal uh, growth. And so that goes back to the idea of loving your neighbor as your, yourself. We're, of course, talking about people who have some type of uh, self-love uh, to begin with. Um, I'm, I'm finished. I just wanted to add that as another example. Please continue. Oh, that's it. I'm fine. I, 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 um, I get it. I get caught up with this because there are so I have had so many counseling sessions with with abusive people, males in particular, and females who are embracing it as normality, but yet at the same time uh, want to get away from it. You can't have it both ways. So so uh, and if I and if I sound like I am where I am excited because I, I just can't stand it. That's all. That's just a pet peeve of mine. You, you have no right to put your hand on anyone. Any questions about that? This is uh, Amy. I got a, a question about that more. So, do um, you think that um, women who um, experience this abuse, do you think it's, may, I mean, it has to do with um, the child, you know, this day of a person was traumatized, um, coming up where they was um, abused, molested, or whatever, and they was already dealing with um, feeling like, you know, through them experiences that they just, you know, was didn't, I guess, love themselves. So, when they did meet a person and that person appeared to be, because you can appear to be and say, oh, I love you, I love you, and this, but when it's all said and done, you get a whole different result. Um, you see the person in a whole different way. And then, you know, some people know when a person is vulnerable and they take advantage, of, you know, of, the, of that person. So that, that's you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. That's one of the reasons why if you have childhood trauma, it is very important to get help in dealing with it uh, as quickly as you can. And the reason I say that is because it is not that you made a mistake uh, and ended up with someone uh, who is abusive as much as it is the energy of abuse attracts abusive, abusive people or other energy that is abusive. If you deal with it, you're less likely for that to happen. You can't, you can't feel like or believe that your life is doomed uh, to that type of relationship simply because that's what you, uh, that's what you ended up with a, a second time or a third time or whatever. Uh, and I do, I do uh, invite uh, I, I, anyone for that matter, but, um, uh, Kath, that you want uh, help me with that, if you may, if you will, because of the number of cases like that you've dealt with, that I know you dealt with. Are you speaking to me, Pastor? That's with the case. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you you pretty much summed it up because when you've experienced trauma in any in any stage of your life, it warps or I, I hate to use that term, warps, but it distorts your or alters 
your um, yourself. And as a result of that, that's why I asked that question because love comes naturally when you know how to love yourself. And you even recognize what love looks like when you know how to love yourself. But like um, the example that Angela gave, when you've been in a situation where you've been traumatized and other things have caused you to call, call into question how you even feel about yourself, and then someone comes along and says all the right things to make you feel like um, they are helping you to embrace yourself and, and all of a sudden showing you what love is supposed to look like, then you get involved in that situation and learn that it was nothing more than a farce, and now you uh, you find yourself in an abuse situ- abusive situation all over again. That's why a lot of people who have been abused end up picking the abuser as their mate the next time because it becomes a a cycle that they don't know how to break. And that's why I thought it was important. And like I said, Linda and I were just able to chime in about not even 30 minutes ago. So we missed most of the discussion. But when I was hearing on love, I think the premise for understanding love is that basis of understanding how to love yourself first and not realizing that it's something that um, I don't look for for someone else to give me to complete me because I recognize in and of myself I'm already complete. So I think it's very important that we look at that. I agree. Because if you can't live with yourself, you can't live with someone else. I do. I do feel like, uh, and I and I, I guess for as long as I can remember, um, I've talked. I taught this in relationship. Uh, your completeness does not come from another person. Your completeness has has to be from within. And even before I understood the scriptures like I do now, even when I was the uh, traditional preacher pastor dude, uh, I always believed that um, that no one can complete you at all. It's a difference in completing and complimenting. And someone who right. is not complimenting you, you can compliment each other, but you cannot complete each other. Any, any uh, you want to? Pick that up, anyone, and comment on that or ask questions about that? Okay. No questions? No comments? I Again, I do believe that uh, everything that we talk about, every question we raise, Every response we give is for for someone on this line or someone connected to someone on this line. It is necessary to put it in the macro because change must take place. Um, Are there any questions or comments? I'll just uh, comment with uh, what... uh... Kathy just said and what we were talking about uh, earlier in terms of, um, and I'm only saying this because uh, it may help someone um, who's going with it in terms of a, a better understanding. The idea that you have to love yourself first. Well, I guess starting off first with people who have been um, uh, abused and have already have uh, a distorted understanding of you of, of what uh, love is, and it's still important to leave uh, whatever situation that is when that abusive relation, um, excuse me, abusive behavior is present. And I, I'm not sure who said something uh, early, but someone asked a question. But once that happens, it also allows enough room for that person, give them more room to grow and to um, form a better relationship with themselves in terms of love as well. And typically when that happens, when we separate ourselves from certain uh, situations, you also have a a moment of clarity and you also have the opportunity to uh, grow. And that's how we look back at situations and we just like, wow, I was in this particular situation. Well, at this new uh, point, when we're looking back, we have a new understanding and we're looking at that situation um, with, uh, a, a, I would say, a greater sense of ourselves and looking back and seeing um, 
how we were doing something that we definitely wouldn't uh, wouldn't do now. But I just wanted to say that part. It it it's, it still goes in hand in hand. Yes, we uh, we must love ourselves and we must cultivate a relationship with ourselves, etc. We also need to remove ourselves from situations where that is not happening because staying in that relationship will also hinder us from um, growing that uh, that relationship um, with ourselves. In regards to the uh, compliment, yes, that is never going to happen. It doesn't matter who and and what. Uh, well, who we actually meet and interact with, that person, no person, period, is ever going to be able to fulfill us and make us a uh, whole. That is actually including uh, just uh, Jesus. If you expect Jesus to be some man and just read about him every day and for him to make you whole. All those things we have to uh, find um, not find, but discover and walk in and embrace of our uh, selves. When we talk about. I don't uh, want to. Go ahead. Go ahead, Shell. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. If you, if you, uh, uh, well, when we talk about um, the idea of sin and we talk about entanglement, that is actually kind of very close and literally what we're actually talking about. Um, uh, we're talking about feeling um, less than, we're talking about not feeling uh, whole, um, we're talking about feeling uh, separated, we're talking about not in, totally embracing um, who we are and looking down um, on, on who we are, so to speak. All of that is the, uh, is the same um, and, and related, but everything that we're, we're for the most part, talking about that's <sighs> yeah, Regina. It just happened. I run my internet every Tuesday. I mean, um, I have Wi-Fi, and I always have my uh, phone uh, just all day on Wi-Fi. And I'm not sure if it's just doing that a certain time of the day on Tuesdays. So I'm about to just start After using the, tone, the uh, regular uh, Followed by tongue. Uh, Your call has been placed in conference. Uh, first of all, God is not a matchmaker. That dude on eHarmony.com be talking soft and preach like if he won't. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Enter your participant ID. You are in the meeting now. There are two participants in the meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Go ahead. Go ahead. Shell is not back yet. Oh, what about this? Go ahead. Someone was about to say something. Female voice. I have a question. I'll say something. Well, either one, you're running, uh, the one which one? Go ahead, uh, go ahead. I, 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 quick question. Okay, yeah, I know, um, Pastor, I mean, when you're saying that God's not a matchmaker, not a, not a matchmaker. Uh, okay, now, what about, um, so explain Adam and Eve? They are not people. They are spirit. Okay. One spiritual entity. It's not Adam and Eve. It is um, Adam, which is an, a a compilation of male and female, and Eve does not mean woman. Eve means the source of all life, or a place where you make decisions. And it, 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 that's what that means. The, the Hebrew word for Eve means a fork in the road, or uh, one in uh, the entity. Isha, I'm sorry, the ish, the maleness of Adam said, Eve shall be your name, for you are the giver of all life, or the source of all life. So that is not a man, any woman, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions or comment about that, Lamont? 
Yeah, my, well, my comment, yeah, when you were saying that God not being matchmaker, I understand that. Because um, I feel that we do, we do bring people, certain people into our lives. You know, we be looking for a certain, certain type of person, or if you have a certain type of uh, personality, you bring certain people into your life. Uh, we we're we're in control. I, I do believe that we are in control of that. Right. Yeah, absolutely right. We are in control of that. Because I can't tell you the number of people who I know who God put together that divorced. Gotcha. Yes, ma'am. The way Lamont said that, are we not the God that attracts that person into our own life? And I'm Elohim. Absolutely. And that's the person that I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about when I say God, right? Putting folk in your life. Yes. Okay. All right. If, if you attract that person yourself, and how you and that person relate uh, determines the uh, extent or the direction of the relationship. How many people you know who uh, have married someone, and now they they were like, you know what? I didn't think that thing through. Or right now, uh, we can be friends, but. The depth of what I thought was is not there. All of us know somebody like that, even whether you want to admit or not. It's true. Some of you probably listen at me. Right now. True, true. <laughs> so, I don't know who that was, and I don't want to know. <laughs> but anyway, Shell, are you back? It's Val. I ain't afraid to say it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes, I'm uh, back. Okay, go ahead. Okay, can can somebody please remind me the last part I was at? Why, Ron, the one tell you that because he don't forget nothing. <laughs> the last thing you said was click. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> well, I think I was uh, talking about the idea of, um, uh, at least at some point, um, uh, of cultivating um, a loving relationship uh, with ourselves uh, and, and being whole. And someone just mentioned um, about us attracting um, uh, other individuals. And yes, that part uh, it is true. Um, however, those other individuals that we uh, attract, a lot of times we get stuck in situations and we definitely should not be getting stuck there. That is literally something uh, that is a lesson for us to, uh, uh, to to grow through. And But we sometimes hold on to uh, those things as well. Um, and I use the uh, idea of uh, baby teeth. Baby teeth serve um, a, a, a import, an important purpose for us to eat at a certain point in our lives. Uh, so they're extremely beneficial at that particular point. If they stay in your mouth uh, too long, though, they become a huge hindrance and cause a lot of problems. Well, I say that um, to relate that to some of the situations and relationships uh, that we have as well that um, we should be uh, using to, uh, to grow through. And to not beat ourselves up once we have um, passed that stage and moved on. Um, there needs to be no one cursing out uh, their baby teeth, talking about the little bitty old teeth that we had before. No, they served a, a great purpose uh, at, at that, at that uh, point in time. If anyone, though, has any other questions um, or any questions uh, in regards to what I was saying that might uh, uh, help or if I wasn't clear about something, um, Please uh, bring it up and say say so. No, I'm finished. Any any questions about what Sheldon said or comment? Ron, earlier you were going to say something. Yes, sir. I, I uh, this is this is a, a subject that, it, as well as I can tell. Uh, by the passion in everybody's voice, this is something that's been near and dear to me as well for a very long time. Um, and and I think about this. This is an issue that's that's global. 
uh, men have dominated women and uh, to the point where it is normal. Women think that uh, that is their role uh, to not be equal to men. And in some cultures, even when the son is a certain age, he is held in higher esteem than his mother, and his mother has to walk behind him. And uh, that is something that has carried on for generations and generations in the earth. That, to me, says that the feminine energy is extremely powerful. And for whatever reason, it has been held in a position of submission for a very long time in the earth. Uh, and, you know, the role that it will play into bringing balance is yet to be seen. But maybe that's why we're having this discussion. Uh, that place of submission has been readily seen uh, uh, very easily in the black woman, whether, you know, uh, we're, we're talking here in America or uh, anywhere on the globe. And maybe, just maybe, she is the catalyst for unlocking this energy and bringing about the spiritual balance that I speak of. And maybe that's why we're talking about this. Uh, you can go back to slavery and see how uh, people were pitted against each other based on skin color, based on gender, and even in uh, societies after slavery, you see where, uh, you, you know, in a very subtle ways, uh, men and women are separated by classes uh, and may even at one point, uh, the professional black woman could think that she had no equal and nobody was there for her. Uh, so it, it, a lot has taken place to bring about separation. And maybe this conversation is uh, the start of, of uh, uniting and bringing unity uh, with, with uh, the, the feminine energy that the, the balance that it's supposed to be the right place that it's supposed to have in the area. And uh, because I, I think, uh, as Pastor said, there's, there's no coincidence that we're having this. And uh, where this goes from here, I don't know. But I think it's a uh, very powerful conversation. And, and you just, you know, I, I usually don't say a whole lot on Monday nights. Uh, but I, I could just feel the energy of this conversation. It, it just kind of, uh, kind of awakened me. Uh, both spiritually and physically, I might add. But uh, I, I've uh, enjoyed the passion to hear everybody uh, as we explore this. And that's, that's all I want to say. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Uh, Pastor, maybe perhaps you can uh, speak on this. Something, uh, a big beef that I uh, have definitely with... Uh, uh, I guess how um, the black church and religion has used uh, the Bible um, is that a lot of women are raised with the idea that they're supposed to be submissive. And so a lot of this uh, self-identity that we actually are, are talking about, um, it's, I mean, it's based on that, it's, it's taught. And so there also needs to be a, a breaking uh, away of that and not holding on to that misguided uh, concept. Uh, I agree. The, the, this is the, the, the funny thing about it. Roy made the statement about um, the, the um, innate power of that feminine energy, of that female. Um, as um, shown by how she is treated. When you think about it, the greatest power in any congregation is feminine. Because if all of the feminine power females walk out of that place, there is nobody left except a handful. 
all of the labors in that setting is put on the shoulders of the uh, female. And all of the um, rewards for labor are given to males, especially the one who are, is in leadership. Um, the ones who are treated the worst relationships are females. There are hundreds of females who have gone to for pastoral counseling because of circumstances in their relationship, and and 95 out of 100, the regardless of whose responsibility is for what they're going through, even if it's clearly the, the male's responsibility, that pastor always comes down on that male side. When it's the male, you pray through it. When it's the female, he chastises. Um, so in order for us to um, to see a change in that regard, we do have to have discussions like this, but more importantly than that, uh, the, the females, especially those who are on, um, are hearing us now, must also um, take the initiative uh, to refuse uh, uh, to be the burden bearer for things they don't even believe in or being the brunt of everything that is wrong, or being uh, the financial um, arm of these institutions that have no regard for humanity at all. And what I mean by financial arm, there is no one who raises more money for churches than females. There is no one who raises more money for the pastor than females. So whenever you think about you're going to be the fundraiser, a chief fundraiser for a, a system, an institution that does not have any respect for you. Ask yourself this question. Uh, would you raise funds for the Ku Klux Klan? Because it's so different. They have no respect for you. And the only thing that you can do for any of them is be used by them. So... That's the same principle that's involved when it comes to these um, religious institutions that are governed uh, by males and males only. It doesn't matter whether you are a female reverend or evangelist or pastor in front of your name. It is still a male-dominated institution because uh, you are still under the thumb of that ecclesiastical leadership, and it is predominantly male if not 100% male. Uh, I have I have watched how associations and conventions function and uh, watching the way they function in organizational structures. Everything that's female comes under the thumb of the, um, uh, of the um, males, and everything that is male is ruled by the male. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that it is um, we need to talk about this, but until females start responding differently, it's not going to change. And if you're hearing it and you don't intend to change, then it's, it's doing you no good uh, to hear it. Um, you, you must not only but, yeah, be a catalyst, yes, but also in that regard, a teacher and a leader to make sure that this does not uh, continue. And, and, and when I looked at associational structures, uh, regardless of the position of that female in that association, she had to answer to a male. Otherwise, um, she did not have any um, power or a voice in, in, that, in that institution. Uh, even if a male, a female is in a church, I remember the first time that the association ordained a female, and they told that female that uh, she had to come under the authority of a male in order for her uh, to be a pastor in that setting. But no other male was uh, told, no male was ever told that. So there are, and I have to go on and on with this, but... um. I'm not going to belabor the point, but I think you get what I'm saying. I'm, I'm hoping, Sheldon, that that's what you were referencing. Yes, I, I was, yes, yes. 
the same thoughts and and essentially the women on the call having to uh, face or any woman for that matter um that what they were told instructed to be in terms of being submissive and being less than was a, a lie and as long as you buy uh, into that in regards to what we're talking about um uh, with self uh love and wholeness and things like that that will be impossible for any individual to reach as long as they uh, have the just I am here to serve and be submissive and second behind a man attitude or thoughts. Uh, the other thing is that I, I, I said this before, but I want to reiterate it. Um, this is another thing that's awfully distasteful to me. And, and, and I do have um, a passion about this. When, when males feel like simply because they are the uh, primary uh, breadwinner, uh, either they make more or they do only one, that that gives them the power uh, to manipulate or to control the actions and thoughts of, of the females simply because um, they are somewhere in the labor force. That, well, that in itself, is totally against the scriptures and against um, the universe itself. Because it, when you really think about the reality of that, um, the only and I've said this before, the only difference is that the male is, has the, the uh, physical brute strength not to dominate, but because he's the hunter gatherer to make provision uh, for the family while the village is uh, actually governed by uh, the female, and and, and the um, the nurturing is uh, from the, the primary nurturing, I should say, is is from the female. So I I um I think that we need to probably address this uh, even more. But I, I know that we're not just going to plan to do it. If it comes up, it comes up. But this is something I think we must always keep in mind. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Hello? Did everybody leave me? No, I'm, I'm good. We're still here. We're still here. Okay. Just listening. I, I thought I was left all alone. <laughs> We're here. Okay. Are there any questions, other questions or comments? Because I do believe that this is a a, a discussion that we we um are destined to have. Yeah, this is uh Angela. I got another um I have a quick well uh, a question. Um it's it's a sensitive subject, but uh it's about uh, sex trafficking. Yeah, that I mean that I'm pretty sure everybody, but that just bothered me. It was just on my mind when we were thinking about the um, talk about women, and you know it bothers me to um, whether TV or whether a movie came out or whatever to see that a child is sold um, to sex. Well. The, I, the sex trafficking is um, involves children. Yes, it, do, it does, but um, also adults. And um, when we when we think about it, we we have to um, be mindful that sex trafficking could not possibly be successful if the people in power uh, were not engaged in it themselves. Um, don't think that it is a coincidence that um, Epstein died in that cell that night. And don't think that it is a, a that, that that was one of those um, anomalies that he was engaged in sex trafficking 
and 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 those people who were named were lied upon. Don't you believe that? Um, in order for us to take an offensive uh, action against the sex trafficking and be able uh, to uh, put a stop to it, uh, we have to deal with the influence that we are exerting over the leadership that is currently um, in, in not in office but in power. And I'm not just talking about the leadership that is uh, that has political power. I'm talking about the leadership that has power, period. Because uh, without that, without the um, the the uh, go ahead uh, or the acquiescence uh, from the powers that currently exist, it would not exist at all. So that therein lies um, the um, the difference, Angela. There has to be some method, some some desire rather, uh, beyond just talk to deal with it. Uh, see how quiet it has been since uh, the lady who was helping him got arrested. Uh, you can cool believe that there's every effort being made behind the scenes to either uh, silence her or make some kind of deal so that nothing ever comes of it. So we, in our endeavors, have to um, uh, do everything we can to make sure that they cannot minimize um, the wrong that has been done or, and still is being done to these children females and males who are being kidnapped and forced into uh, uh, um, forced to be sexual slaves. Anyone else want to come in on that? Uh, uh, raise the question about that? And that is inclusive of you too, Andrew, or anyone else on this line. I was just wondering if you're going to get to the, I mean, where it just I mean, I know it's being exposed. It's being exposed now, but to the point to where it just, you know, it stopped. You know, well, it's not. It's not about getting to the main one, as much as it is about changing uh, the um, uh, the the thought, the desires of, of of humanity. The sex trafficking is nothing new. This has been taking place forever and a day. It is it, spoken of more now uh, because of social media. It, it, communications are much, much easier now. So it's not that difficult, um, you know, to, for people to, um, or to engage in conversations about it. So just as we are engaged in every effort um, to alter the thought patterns for the purpose of balance, when we bring balance to humanity, we also um, bring righteousness. And with righteousness, you cannot be a sex trafficker. You want, That is not something that you even desire to do. Does that make sense, dear? Mm-hmm. Anyone else? Thank you. I'm going to add to Pastor on the hill for that. When we bring balance, we also will shut down the industries of pornography and all over these children are, are being exploited in the first place. So balance brings all of that into control and, and it does away with all of it. Absolutely. Any other questions about that? No questions, no comments. All righty. Um, I um, am most appreciative for uh, the question that, that was sent, as well as the uh, response uh, to um, the discussion tonight, if you were just simply a listener and not a uh, verbal participator. So I um, look forward to... Um, Speaking with you again on um, on Saturday, and until then, if there are questions, 
please feel free uh, to submit them to one of us, and we will make sure that we um, get it to the place where it can be discussed. Okay? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Have a good right. weekend, everyone. Good, one, good night. Bye, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.